Shabbat Shalom. You may be seated. Oi, oi! Did I, did that, that, you could hear that. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, we love to see those kids here in shul. It makes us feel alive and vibrant, even if we're not. <laughs> it's wonderful to see them come. Wonderful to see them go. <laughs> No, we love those little kids. Keep them far away from us. <laughs> remember that? Do you remember that? That was a, a statement from Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. It was the czar. Oh, it wasn't little kids. It was the czar. I don't know. I don't know how I confused them. So I'm going to do something to start this sermon this morning that you're going to be quite angry with me about because it's going to stick in your head all day. You're going to have difficulty getting it out. It's what we call a melody worm. A melody worm is something that you get a tune in your head and then you can't get it out. It's stuck with you all day. I'm not suggesting that this tune is going to do that, but it probably will. It goes like this. You got to know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. You better, you never count your money. When you're sitting at the table, there'll be time enough for counting when the dealing's done. Remember that song? Should we sing it again? No. You gotta know when to hold. You didn't know you were gonna get a song and a dance today, but you got it. it it's a great song. I think it was made popular by Kenny Rogers, but I don't think it was originally a Kenny Rogers song. But it doesn't matter who wrote it, it's indicative of an idea that is incredibly important, and that is you have to know in life when it's important to stick with something, to continue to pursue your goal. And then sometimes it's important to recognize it's time to lay down your cards and walk away. It's incredibly difficult to know when that moment is. Because we're always struggling with the idea that we don't want to be quitters. But there has to be a moment at which you say to yourself, I recognize this situation has reached its logical conclusion and it's time to move on. For many people, it's in place of employment where they recognize they've gone as far as they're going to go where they are, and it's time to part ways and move on. For some, we find it in relationship, in which we recognize that this relationship has gone on as far as it possibly can, and there's time to break and to move on. But it's difficult to know. It's hard in day-to-day -day life to recognize that there is a singular moment in which things have radically changed and the circumstance in which we find ourselves is no longer healthy. Because that's not how it usually works. It usually works that it builds up to a moment and then it's something small that causes us to crack. There's something small in which we say, I'm done, I can't do it anymore. You know the phrase well, the straw that broke the camel's back, means there's something small that happens. It would be easy if life were made up of extraordinary moments in which we had defining segments. And we could say to ourselves, we've reached our moment. We've gotten as far as we can go. 
But as you know, sometimes it takes flying too high before you reach the sun and you plummet to your demise. So I offer you this morning an incredibly difficult theological challenge. And to offer it, I want you to know, not lightly, because the potential for understanding of this sermon is one that will drive you from organized religion and common theology. And it's never the job of the rabbi to ask you to question your relationship with the Almighty. It's the job of the rabbi to reinforce a sense of God's eternal love and compassion. That God is forever a loving, giving, caring being. And that if you don't understand God's ways because you think God is being cruel, then you're misunderstanding God. But this morning's parsha leaves me with more questions than I do have answers. So let me start with the story that is, of course, most troubling to me. And I'm not alone in it. Plenty of rabbis and other theologians have been challenged by this story long before I even came into existence. The story of the binding of Isaac's story is a challenging one. The story is a simple one. God says to Abraham, take your son, the son that you love, climb the mountain and sacrifice your son. And Abraham says, Hineni, I'm here. I'll do what you ask of me. And that is, in fact, the last conversation that Abraham and God have. It is the last words God says to Abraham. In fact, it's such a moment of fracture that when God doesn't want Abraham to sacrifice his son in the end, to show it was just a test and not a reality, God doesn't come God's self and say, no, stop. But God sends an emissary, a messenger. Maybe it's in this moment that God recognizes that God has gone too far and made a request that is far beyond what's acceptable. And God can't utter another word. Or maybe it's God's recognition that God has gone so far that no matter what he says now, Abraham can't hear it. And because of it, God says, I'm not going to try. We all know moments in our lives, circumstances in which we found ourselves, in which no matter what the other is saying, that they've already said too much. And we stop listening. You've been in circumstances, I'm sure, in which arguments have unfolded. In which at some point, the person you're arguing with turns and walks away. And if you don't say it out loud, you certainly think it in your head. Where are you going? Don't turn your back on me. I'm not done talking. But the other has stopped listening. And sometimes the excuse is given, I don't want to say something I regret. And so we just stop talking. We stop listening can't be heard anymore because we've already said too much. The Midrash picks up on this. The rabbis in discussing this moment say, Asara nisyonot nitnasa Avraham avinu ve'amad bekulam. That God tested Abraham 10 times. And Abraham rose to the occasion each and every time. And then Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, this great Midrash, lists all 10 of these. And I'm not going to go through them all, but you recognize some of them. Immediately, if you know the story of Abraham's life, you recognize some of them. God says to Abraham, how about this? Circumcise yourself. That's not a test. I don't know what is. 
at 99 years old, <laughs> circumcise yourself. At some point, you have to say to yourself, did I hear that right? I know I'm 99 years old. But Abraham listens and does. But Abraham listens and does because from early in childhood, we already know that he stands the test. When his father is an idol maker, Abraham rises to the occasion and smashes those idols. When Abraham's father, Terah, goes to punish him, Abraham withstands that test as well. When God says, we're going to take you to a land in which you're going to flourish, but there's a famine and he's required to leave and go down to Egypt, he withstands that test. And when he sees that there is a king, a pharaoh, who's in charge, who's going to be in love with his wife, he withstands that test as well. Time and time again, the Midrash accounts for us the moments in which Abraham is tested, culminating in the moment of the binding of Isaac, the story of the sacrifice of his own son. And Abraham says, I'll do it, but this is it. I'm done. I won't be tested anymore. Because while I may be able to continue to stand to the occasion, I may rise to the moment, God, we can't go on like this anymore. We can't keep testing each other. If at some point you don't believe I am a faithful servant, there's nothing I can do to prove it to you. And Abraham potentially says, it's enough with the testing already. We all find ourselves in circumstances in which we're looking for an indication that there's some trust that's been developed. And if you keep testing in your relationships over and over again, guess what? The person administering the test is ultimately going to be the one who fails. Because you can't live in a relationship like that. So we're left with a moment in which Abraham and God come to a fracture. And Abraham says, I can't do it anymore. And not only have we destroyed our connection, Abraham and God, but I've destroyed the connection with Hagar and Ishmael. I've destroyed my connection now with my son Isaac. They too never speak again. In the beginning of next week's parsha, Sarah dies. He destroys the relationship, says the rabbis, between Abraham and Sarah because when she hears of this moment, she dies of a broken heart. The extraordinary destruction that's wrought by testing over and over again leaves us with the question, can you ever pass? Or is it time to just move on? You got to know when to stay. And you have to know when to move on. Abraham doesn't quit after the first test or the second or the third. It takes 10 times for Abraham to say, you know what? I've done my part. I worked diligently. It's now somebody else's turn to take over. I did everything I could do. But now it's time for someone else to take over. I just want you to know the Midrash doesn't end that way. Perkei Rabbi Eliezer ends with this beautiful statement. It says, Ahmad Avraham, Abraham withstood every single test. And he prayed to God at the end of every test and he says, Master of the universe, it's not because of my capacity to withstand the tests it's not because of my own capacity that I was able to execute every one of those. It's because you protected me and you saved me in this world and you will continue to be my protector in the world to come. Abraham doesn't leave this moment saying, God, you have broken everything. You have destroyed everything. I can't have a relationship with you. 
But he says rather at the conclusion of our time together, I want you to know I appreciate all the gifts you gave me. I appreciate all the protections and all the moments of growth that you have created for me. God, I believe with perfect faith that you're the Almighty, you have a plan. And that I thank God that I've been able to be a part of it. I've learned so much. I've grown so much. I have capacity that I never imagined I had before because of you. I'm sorry, it has to be over. When our relationships end in our lives, whether they're in the workplace environment or in our own personal lives, we need to take an accounting of all the gifts we received in those relationships. Not to say, I wish it never happened. Not to walk away bitter and angry and frustrated, holding on to that. But rather, we have to say to ourselves what a blessing it was to have had that in our life in that moment and that it's okay for it to be over. But ultimately, we're left with the same question. You got to know when to stay or when to go. So I'll give you one last song. Hopefully, it'll override the first one. You know the song? You have to, sometimes you have to stay. Sometimes you have to walk away. Sometimes you got to know how to say goodbye. So look, I leave you with a simple message this week. If you find yourself in a relationship that is challenging, that's okay. If it's abusive, you got to get out. If it's one that helps you to become more than you thought you were capable of, then you got to work at it. But if it's crossed the line, you know it. And it's time to get out. You got to know when to stay or when it's time to go. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. We continue with Musaf, page 184.